Great, Lisa. Thanks for the uh, thanks for the introduction. I am going to talk today, sort of at the higher level, um, coming at things from basically a um, a farmer perspective uh, and using that farmer perspective to drive some of the research that we do here on Sclerotinia. So let's get in. Before I sort of dig into the seminar, I do want to just introduce my team sort of virtually. I do have a great team uh, behind me. They get to do all the work. I get to be the, the mouthpiece, so to speak, of all the work that they do. But I have uh, a couple of great technicians with Carol Groves here on the left. A uh, student of mine uh, here, Kelly Debink, another technician, Brian uh, Mueller, and then a, a couple of graduate students here, Wade Webster, who I'll be talking about some of his research on sclerotinia. Of course, myself next in that picture, and then Rodrigo Pedrozo, uh, and then also uh, Maxwell Chibuagu uh, uh, in my lab as well. And then finally, a postdoc, uh, Camilla Nikolai. Uh, who handles some work on corn that we do. So got a big team behind me. They do a lot of great research and I'm, I'm happy to talk about some of the work that they do here today. So I just kind of want to give you some perspective in terms of the importance of uh, white mold uh, or sclerotinia stem rot uh, here in the upper Midwest US. We, we keep track of this. The plant pathologists in the Midwest keep track um, each year uh, what the estimated yield loss is. And we recently published on the last uh, five years from uh, 2019 back. So this state is from 2015 to 2019. And we're looking at uh, the north central uh, northern US. So we're kind of where sclerotinia really has a strong foothold. And we're looking at the top 10 diseases in each year. Uh, whoops, I'm going to back up. My, my mouse is a little sensitive. But you, as you can see, in each year, uh, sclerotinia out, out of Four out of the five years, sclerotinia is in the top five in terms of disease, with many of those years uh, having sclerotinia uh, as the second most important disease behind uh, soybean cyst nematode. If we look at the economic impact that's estimated just in those north central states, so there's basically 10 or so states that this impacts with about five that are directly impacted, we have an average uh, economic uh, impact of around $4.69 a loss per acre. So when you extrapolate that out, an average annual loss is over $322 million a year. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial uh, and important disease here in the North Central and causes quite a bit of impact. Many of you probably are familiar with the disease cycle, but it wouldn't be a plant pathologist talk without at least one disease cycle in the presentation. So I will quickly take you through uh, the disease cycle because a lot of the work that we do is very, very much tied to this cycle. Okay. And so we, we, you know, I'll start here with the formation of these sclerotia. So those survival structures that are in the upper pro, upper uh, soil profile, those things germinate uh, and that germination event to give rise to this apothecia or cup-like mushroom is, is basically timed very closely with the physiology of the soybean plant and also the weather. So, you know, there's a lot of important work been done in terms of temperature and wetness and, and those sorts of things that drive sclerotinia, but also there's a lot of canopy and architectural impacts that uh, play a role in terms of infection. In the U.S., about 90 to 95 percent of the infections occur at the flowering time in soybean. This is different than some other crops, so we're just talking about soybean here, where we have primarily ascosporic infections that uh, infect through uh, flowers that are either open or senescing. So our primary time uh, for this infection is between that first flower to first pod set, so the R1 to R3 growth stages in soybean. That's our major window of infection. Then about two to three weeks goes by and then we start to see the damage that that infection causes uh, with you know, expansion of uh, the lesions, the development of the white mycelium that's characteristic of white mold or sclerotinia stem rot, and then the formation of sclerotia again. So we do have a classic monocyclic uh, disease here in the north central, the sclerotia do have to go through a, a weathering process. And in, in our area, that weathering is generally a cold treatment. Uh, given our snow cover and, and cold uh, winters that we have here. In terms of the weather that coincides with this, uh, it's basically um, uh, high humidity, uh, not ne necessarily excessive rain, uh, but rain can contribute. And then we do know from some work with Marty Chilver's lab at Michigan State that canopy closure is very important. 
especially between row uh, canopy closure of 40% or more. Here's just a nice visual of actual impact, and then I'll talk about the actual yield loss by the numbers here. But you can see this is a production field in the center of uh, Wisconsin. We have a large area that's that's basically sand uh, in the central part of the state, and it's heavily irrigated. So we have uh, a lot of white mold that occurs in that area of the, of, the, of the state. And you can see this is late August. You can see all the infections out here. This is a former graduate student of mine, Jamie Wilbur. I'll be talking about some of her work. And then you can see same feel, just a slightly different perspective here uh, towards uh, full maturity, but you can see a lot of these beans uh, already uh, pretty much senesced. This uh, particular field, uh, the, the yield was reduced by about 50% uh, where we had uh, healthy beans to where we had those severely infected. So it was a, it, it was a heavy impact and classic here in, in the upper Midwest. I do wanna just talk quickly about how we actually look at uh, disease here. We, we take a couple of different uh, data points when I'm talking about the yield loss here, and this is important to understand because we use this DIX term, which is actually a um, conglomeration of disease incidents, which is the percent of plants that are actually infected. And then we also do a disease severity estimation, which is a zero to three scale. And then we take that disease severity and disease incident score and smash them together into a DIX. And once that's transformed, it is on a zero to 100% scale, uh, with zero obviously being no disease, 100% would be total uh, plant death. The zero to three is important because that accounts for where the damage occurs. And in modern soybean varieties, we have a lot of soybeans that heavily branch. So it's really important to understand where those infections occur, whether it's on a lateral branch versus a main stem, because a lateral branch hit is less impactful to yield uh, versus one of those main stem hits, which would kill the entire plant. So you can see zero, no infection, one infection on branches, two, a non-girdling um, infection, and then three is a pretty devastating main stem infection. So if we take that disease index score and then we fit that uh, to some yield loss uh, data that we've had accumulated over the past few years here in the upper Midwest, you can actually see that the yield loss curve is not linear. And the reason for that, again, is related to this sort of where are the, where is the damage primarily occurring? And we know in the, this shallower portion of the curve, there is some yield loss that is a sort of a negative slope to that line, but it's not as dramatic uh, as when we get into the steeper part. And the primary reason for that, again, is because of this um, lateral, these are primarily lateral branch hits that occur in this lower DIX score. Once we get into the uh, steeper part of the curve, those are mainly main stem hits. So it's really important to understand this. And the reason why we started thinking about that is because a lot of our farmers here noticed that, you know, if they would harvest soybean fields that had some white mold, but not a lot, they often couldn't detect yield loss in those areas. And so that started getting us thinking about, you know, looking at where those infections actually occur. So we do have some differences in terms of, you know, the impact and in, in, in how that relates to disease scores. In terms of management, management's really complicated. We've published some work on this, just looking at the sort of multi-pronged approach that it takes to, you know, really manage this to the nth degree. There's no one thing that's really going to be a silver bullet. You know, keeping good field history notes, mapping the field, we're starting to work on using um, UAV technology to actually map, map past infections so we could do some prescription seeding technology or some of those things. Uh, canopy row width and po plant population management, I'll talk a little about some work there, crop rotations, there's a lot of chemical control that happens here in the north central US and also some biological control, but those things uh, can be incomplete uh, or, uh, you know, it, you know, giving us 50% reductions at best and a lot of that's related to just timing of application and some of those things. So that brings us to some of the main questions that the farmers ask us, you know, you know, we get a lot of questions on when should we spray fungicides, you know, what fungicides work, is there really genetic resistance in the commercial varieties for sclerotinia stem rot or white mold, what cultural practices, practices should I be using, and, you know, what new technologies are out there coming along, so I'm going to just kind of hit the high level on some of these questions. I'll start with our prediction and fungicide work that we've been doing. I do want to make it clear that all this is research-based. Here's four papers that we've published. 
uh, sort of documenting this work. I'm going to kind of cook this down into, again, a higher level um, discussion, and then we can dig in if the, the group wants towards the end. Just to look at fungicide uh, programs, we do have some fungicide programs here in the north central US, uh, which are pretty effective, but their efficacy does relate to disease pressure again. So we did quite a bit of work in a meta-analysis that uh, Jamie Wilbur had done looking at relative yield reductions according to the control with 10 different programs, fungicide and, and actually one herbicide program. So this one in the blue box is actually an herbicide lactofen, which actually is labeled for suppression of white mold. And what's interesting is we have a heavy reliance actually on lactofen because folks like it because it's, it's cheap relative to some of the fungicide programs. But in low disease pressure situations, the injury that happens applying uh, six ounces of lactofen actually at that R1 growth stage actually gives us a negative yield um, uh, against the control because of that damage. In high disease pressure situations, in other words, where that yield loss curve is real steep, we do see some utility with that particular program, but you can see a lot of the fungicide programs here are doing quite a bit better, especially those that include a, a product called Boscolid, which here in the US is labeled as Endura. We also rely heavily on another uh, product called Picoxystrobin, which is one of the strobularin fungicides here. You can see these programs giving us some pretty good uh, yield um, uh, preservation relative to the control. But you know, it's at best, we're looking at about 25% uh, yield preservation um, in our best programs with some of, the, some of the worst programs at, you know, in the five to 10% range. So nothing's perfect, but we do get uh, some relative reductions. A lot of the success though, uh, in these programs is really related to timing. And if you don't get the timing right, uh, it, it can go south on you really fast. And so we've also looked at a uh, disease index reduction relative to the control uh, versus various timings, uh, either a single application of product at the various growth stages here, uh, where we have five uh, leaves out or the beginning of flower all the way through to the R5 growth stage. We also have two spray programs in here uh, and you, as you can see, the best disease index reductions occur where we have uh, those two spray programs, but we do have some programs that give us some statistically similar reductions with single applications. So again, timing usually optimized within that uh, bloom period out to maybe the R4 growth stage or so. But once we get to R5, it really is too late uh, to apply a fungicide and expect a lot of really good control there. And again, if you go too early, say before V5 or at V5, not a lot of reduction there either. So maximizing our use of those products occurs during timing. This can be a real uh, you know, head scratcher though uh, for folks in terms of the economics. And so uh, sort of nested within that, uh, all of that work that we did with a meta-analysis, we actually developed some economic models. And I won't go into all the economics here, but we do have a freely available app called Spore Buster, which is essentially a fungicide program calculator. Folks can make some adjustments uh, looking at their expected price of sale for soybeans or expected yield, and then their local, their local prices for these particular products. And then the list will resort itself and, and help the farmer make some decisions on what the break-even probabilities would be in a particular program for their farm. And then also uh, what the average net gain might be uh, given their scenarios. But, you know, we know that the timing of those fungicides is really dependent or the success of those fungicide programs is really dependent on the timing. So how do we sort of pin that down? How do we make that decision on if the weather is truly conducive or not? And could we actually save ourselves a fungicide application because they are quite expensive for us to apply? Can we actually save a fungicide application if we don't actually need it, if the weather's not conducive? So this led to some work where we were looking at apothecial development and you know, really how important are apothecia in this whole epidemiological um, uh, situation. And I showed you in the disease cycle that they're quite important. We have to have them in soybean, we have to have apothecia there uh, to uh, emit ascospores and those ascospores have to land on flowers. So the majority of infections, about 99 to 95% occur uh, through those flowers. So we did a bunch of work. I won't go into all the details. We can talk more about that during the, the question and answer section. But we did a lot of work uh, counting apothecia in gridded fields. So we laid out grid patterns. We laid out transects uh, for spore trapping. 
took quite a bit of data over multiple years, uh, uh, looking at apothecial development and spore flights. And this uh, is just kind of a snapshot of what happens here. This is actually looking at days after seeding along the x-axis and then average number of apothecia per gridded plot uh, and the blue bars. And we have the growth stages laid out there along the way. And then we also have the average ascospores uh, that are caught per trap uh, overlaid on top of apothecia. What you can see here is that you have to have the formation of those apothecia to have subsequent ascosporic flights uh, in those fields. And a lot of the infections actually come from in-field inoculum. So we do get some edge effect, but the majority, at least here in the Midwest, the majority of infections seem to happen from infield inoculum. There's a very steep dispersal gradient. XB Yang did some work uh, back in the late 90s looking at the dispersal gradient. And essentially those ascospores go up, they hit the bottom of the soybean canopy and then go back down. So it's a very short distance that those ascospores actually fly. And you can see once the apothecia go away, we lose ascospore trap uh, catches. So you have to have the apothecia there. So we decided to take the approach that we would actually use weather information to model apothecial development. And by doing that, we could actually anticipate or look into that crystal ball to make some decisions on whether we actually needed to apply fungicide or not. We did all that work and developed uh, logistic regression models. Uh, we, we programmed those logistic regression models into an app that we call Sporecaster. We run Sporecaster using gridded GPS reference weather information. So there's quite a bit of work here. We actually published three different uh, papers that actually back our Sporecaster work. Uh, and we've run this now uh, three or four field seasons with uh, this summer being sort of the highlight in terms of actual use. We had uh, downloads on about 3000 devices and we ran about 500 forecasts per day in July, which is our peak uh, sort of white mold decision-making period here. So we're hearing a lot of good feedback. Um, folks like it because they get a real site-specific recommendation with that gridded weather information and they can run it through those models really quick. The phone does all the work for them and they can get an instantaneous uh, prediction for that particular day using this particular app. Just to kind of look at a real world situation where uh, folks are looking at uh, this type of technology, this was a simple strip trial uh, in Marathon County, Wisconsin, which is sort of the epicenter of white mold in the state. And again, this is a non-replicated trial, but a nice visual of some things that we were doing in terms of timing fungicide application, and then I'll overlay what was actually happening with Sporecaster in a minute. On the edges, the standard program in this case would be nine fluid ounces per acre of uh, approach applied at the R1 and R3 uh, growth stages. So you can see this edge and then this edge, and we had 12 to 33 percent, depending on where you were standing in those uh, particular areas, uh, in terms of reduction uh, in, in uh, or I'm sorry, disease incidence, and then about 56 bushels per acre taken uh, off those areas. In the center here, you can see a non-treated uh, check here, 66 percent disease incidence, 41 bushels per acre, so a pretty substantial reduction. A single application applied at R1 in this particular strip, a little bit of improvement, but not much. And then a single application R3 with much improvement here. And then the farmer wanted to see, well, if we did three applications, what would happen? And he actually didn't gain much by adding that uh, second application over the standard two pass. So, you know, as you can see here, the, this single application R3 was really doing most of the work. Why is that? Well, if we overlay uh, sort of the real-time probabilities of apothecial presence, so now, now we're looking at sporecaster predictions. These predictions run on a zero to one or zero to 100 percent uh, probability basis. You can see the growth stages outlined here. It was starting to come up into the high zone here as flowering began, but you can see we really started to tip up so that we had very conducive conditions for apothecial development and subsequent spore flights at that R3 growth stage. And that timing, that single application timing was just very well optimized uh, at that R3 application. And that's why we saw quite substantial reductions. So we're seeing folks not only use uh, this technology to you know, decide whether they should spray or not, but to also optimize and try to boost that investment that they're actually making in some of these expensive uh, fungicide programs.
And I'll switch gears a little bit and, and talk about resistance, which was one of those other questions that folks had uh, on the list. We've done quite a bit of work, as you can see, again, uh, quite a few publications here, about six, uh, uh, where we've published on resistance and some of the work we've done on the resistance side of soybeans. I'll kind of cook this down quick just to say that um, in the, on the commercial side of things, uh, we still have a lot of highly susceptible uh, germplasm out there. These are commercial uh, cultivars, which we screen in the greenhouse each winter. Some of these were supposedly highly field resistant for uh, white mold. When we take them into our screening process um, in the greenhouse, we actually see that a lot of them do not actually have good uh, physiological resistance. In other words, the plants can't actually fight uh, the infection. Probably the resistance we're seeing in the field is an architectural type resistance or an escape mechanism where they're actually just simply escaping infection uh, in the fields, but not actually fighting the infections. What we're interested in looking at is actual, uh, you know, active sort of immune responses and air quotes, if you will. We want to make sure that those plants are actually fighting the infections. So we use this petiole inoculation techniques, which, which was modified from uh, some protocols from uh, folks at the University of Nebraska, where we actually use uh, thick uh, PDA plates. We punch these plugs out and we use these inverted pipette tips to actually inoculate uh, petioles on the lower part of the stems. And then we can measure yield, or I'm sorry, measure lesion length over time using a digital caliper. So it's a pretty simple process. There is a lot of uh, consistency that we have to impart here. So the protocol is not, um, is not necessarily easy because we have to be consistent, but it is fairly straightforward. And using this technique, we've been able to chart different things like uh, genotype responses uh, in the fungus. So we do know that fungal populations can impact uh, different resistant types in a different way. So there's this interaction of the fungal population by the genetic resistance that we deploy. In this work that we published in 2017, you can see we had a resistant variety in the top, a moderately resistant soybean variety in the middle, and then a susceptible in the bottom. And you can see a lot of interaction of various isolates in terms of uh, relative disease level uh, on those inoculated plants with some isolates interacting differently on either a resistant or susceptible variety. So as you might expect, if you're screening soybean varieties, you would like them to be resistant across a wide range of isolates <clears throat> so that when you deploy that soybean into an area where you might experience a different fungal population, it still holds up. And so we've gone through and developed a screening process there. We've reported on the difference in isolates here and, and have made uh, some pushes for the industry to actually look at multiple isolates when they go through their screening process. The other thing we've done in the program is trying to move this resistance forward is actually looking at uh, the development of a, um, a, a sort of a genotype panel that we can use to sort of measure, if you will, the relative resistance in commercial varieties. Uh, my student, Wade Webster, he's uh, developed or, or, or published on uh, four lines here, Dwight, uh, 5123 SSR, 5170, and 5282B, these four lines, which consistently respond uh, to the isolate panel that we have. And you can see this isolate 20 tends to be our most um, aggressive isolate. And so the idea here is, can we take our most aggressive isolate and uh, screen commercial resistance and use our check lines to sort of um, group out the relative resistance in those lines. Once we whittle down the really resistant ones, then we can go back with a smaller group of those lines and actually run the wider range of isolates here. And so we've started to attempt to use this strategy in making selections and trying to push uh, some uh, uh, lines forward actually in a small breeding program here. And we've had some uh, decent success using this particular strategy. We are also curious in that, could we actually use this panel to actually modify Sporecaster? So Sporecaster is actually accurate about 80% of the time. So we do miss about 20% of the time in the field. And when we looked at the data in terms of where we were actually making misapplications, a lot of times we were we were missing either heavy white mold infections or we were actually overspraying uh, in low white mold infection uh, fields. And so this really relates to resistance. 
And can we adjust Sporecaster to actually account for resistance levels? And so what Wade's been doing is actually deploying these four check lines and spraying them differentially with different <clears throat> Sporecaster thresholds. And so you can see some work here he's done where we have Dwight, which is super susceptible and responds quite readily to a fungicide application uh, versus some of our more uh, resistant germplasm here, which actually doesn't respond very much to fungicide application because it's so physiologically resistant. So the idea here is we could take a highly resistant fungicide and actually increase the action threshold in Sporecaster with that information or take a, a susceptible variety and actually decrease that threshold and maybe dial in the accuracy uh, of Sporecaster to improve it. We'd like to see things improve to that 90 uh, percent range. So we have some field trials active right now uh, looking at this and we think there's gonna be some reasonable success uh, as we move forward. I'd like to just transition into some uh, integrated management work we've been doing. This was supported by a USDA project where we deployed uh, field trials all across the upper Midwest here, quite a few here in Wisconsin. We had 11 different site years, about over 1,400 uh, observations where we were actually looking at row spacing, planting populations, and then fungicide applications layered on top. So there's a lot of interest here in the U.S. of pushing yields going with narrow row spacing, really high seed populations. And uh, we know that that really drives, um, you know, white mold here in the, in the U.S. So just to show you uh, some of the data from these trials, again, we have over 1,400 data points here where we're splitting out in the top graph, just the row spacing. So a narrow row spacing or a wide row spacing. And you can see we do get a little higher level, obviously, in the narrow row spacings, but not as much as we would have expected. We actually see a greater response uh, in the planting population side of things, especially in those narrow row spacings. So what this work showed us is that actually, if we, we could preserve our narrow row spacing, which is what farmers would really like to do, because we do have a lot of water hemp weed issues here in the U.S., and we like to plant on those narrow row spacings to deal with our weed problems, but we could actually drop those populations in those narrow row spacings and actually reduce the amount of white mold to a certain extent without jeopardizing yield too much. So the sweet spot for us is somewhere in between that 270,000 seeds per hectare to 345,000, uh, which is translates to about 120,000 seeds per acre for us here in the, in the U.S. And so um, we've been playing around with this a little further. This was some work that we did actually at the Hancock uh, Research Station in Wisconsin. And then also in, in uh, Marty Chilvers did some work in Michigan, where we actually looked at 160,000 seeds per acre uh, versus 100,000 seeds per acre. So 100,000 seeds per acre in the U.S., that would be uh, a pretty low seeding rate for us. Uh, most of the uh, recommendations right now are around 140,000 seeds per acre for us. And you can see uh, where we had high fertility, we do get a higher level of white mold. So we do have a lot of dairy uh, production here. We try to mimic some uh, heavy manure applications with some 150 pounds of actual nitrogen going out. So this would be a high nitrogen rate uh, for soybeans. Uh, and you can see that does push white mold. So we have that big, heavy, thick canopy. But you can see if we drop that seeding rate, we have some really nice reductions in terms of disease index. And especially where we have low nitrogen or no added nitrogen or no added manure here, we, can, we have a pretty good reduction, especially where we use a, a product called Endura, which is, again, that bosculate applied using our spore caster tool. So nice reductions there with really nice responses in terms of yield here, especially in the 100,000 uh, low nitrogen rate where, where we are using Endura. And in fact, these plots uh, basically out yielded our 160,000 seeds per acre because the white mold was so bad. So we're starting to show farmers, you know, if you pay attention to your seeding uh, rates, you might be able to get ahead of white mold to a certain extent or utilize, we have some, we have a lot of variable uh, rate seed technology here on planters, actually moving uh, the populations around, if you will, uh, in, a, in a field, uh, dropping fewer seeds in those high white mold areas and, and, and adding more seeds in the low white mold areas across those fields. I just like to transition here uh, just to talk about a couple of things that we're uh, sort of working towards and then I'll, I'll finish up and we can have a discussion here. But uh, 
couple of new big things we're working on. We're, we're looking at roller crimping uh, in, in cover crop situations. And then we're also looking at host-induced gene silencing. So I'll just take a minute here just to talk about a couple of those tools. We have a lot of interest right now here in the Midwest looking at cover crops and especially rye cover crops and then roller crimping uh, into these, um, these cover crops after we've, we've uh, crimped. And you can see here's our roller crimper in action. Um, actually uh, crimping some rye on the fly here. And the idea is basically, can we form not only a physical barrier, but drop the actual production of apothecia in those fields? Okay, so there's, there's some really good data to show that weed suppression is, is really good under these roller crimped rye situations, but we were really curious what the impact on, on white mold would be. And you can see we have a little, this is our little research. It's a 10 foot wide research with um, a roller crimper that we put some strips out this year on, actually on farm and we're about to take some of that data here. So let me transition into some data here just to back up kind of what I'm saying. This was some work that Sarah Pethybridge had done at Cornell. Uh, some really interesting work where they uh, looked at soybean and dry bean actually planted in fields with a history of white mold. And what they found, I'll just, I'll just focus here on the soybean, which are these upper rows here. And what they found is actually the incidence quite, quite reduced uh, over the two year span in that rye residue versus where they, they had uh, conventional tillage. And what they also did is they have put apothecia, so they actually pre-germinated sclerotia, grew them out to the stipes and then took them physically out to these plots and, and placed them beneath the rye cover crop and then followed them over time in their development. And it's very interesting. What actually happens is the apothecia aborts development. So it no longer produces the cup on top. The stipe development, the stem development happens all in the dark, but there's a light cue that has to happen in order for that cup to form on top. At the same time that Sarah was doing some of this work, we were also doing some work in the lab. Uh, Jamie was finishing up her PhD and was curious just about, um, you know, light, UV range light and what the impact is. And there's some papers out there just talking about how light and the UV spectra really drive a lot of the finishing development of that apothecia. And we use some filters that were in a narrow a uh, set of ranges here. Uh, these, these are in nanometers, 300, 310, and 320, where we actually followed the development of the cup. So what we were actually doing here is, is uh, blocking out certain wavelengths or applying certain wavelengths uh, in these narrow ranges. And you can see it requires somewhere in that 300 to 320 nanometer wavelength in order for those, those apathesia to actually develop. So this was really interesting because a lot of folks think that canopy modification reduces humidity, which it does. And that is important in terms of reducing white mold. But there's also these really intricate light cues that are important that we can sort of disrupt using some of our uh, roller crimping or cover cropping technologies to actually disrupt the development of, of these apothecia. So we've been uh, digging in and kind of looking at this a little further. The other project that we're, uh, we just published on uh, was that host-induced gene silencing work. I'll quickly just talk about uh, briefly what we're doing here. We actually used bean pod model virus as a, as a vector uh, for some silencing constructs. We were specifically going after a, um, an enzyme called ox, oxy, oxaloacetate acetylhydrolase. I can't ever say that uh, very clearly, but essentially what this enzyme does is it, it converts oxaloacetate to oxalate and acetate. So it uncouples the two. And essentially, once we produce oxalate, we have the development of oxalic acid, which is a major pathogenicity factor for the fungus. And so the idea here is if we could actually silence using si uh, small interfering RNA, if we could deliver those using our BPMV uh, transformed virus, could we actually silence 
oxaloacetate acetylhydrolase to the point where we would actually reduce oxalic acid production and subsequent damage in the plants. And you can see uh, in the top here, we have the, um, the silencing construct that's been uh, inserted into these soybeans where we've inoculated and then followed over time out to 120 hours uh, post-infection or post-inoculation. And then we have the act empty vector control here where you can see uh, pretty good lesion developments relative to, uh, to that silencing construct. Just to look at some actual data here, here we actually follow uh, expression levels and then also uh, disease progress curves over time. You can, you can see that the, ex the expression uh, reduction isn't perfect, but it is significant at certain time points. And you can see the overall uh, area uh, or disease progress curves here are statistically significant, especially after two days here, we have some good separation. So there's, there's uh, a significant reduction in terms of damage on these uh, highly susceptible varieties of soybean where we uh, use the VIG system to induce uh, host-induced gene silencing. So the, some of the next steps would be to actually take some of our susceptible, or I'm sorry, our resistant germplasm that we've bred through our breeding program and apply some of these uh, technologies there to further uh, reduce the damage that we might see on, on those particular soybean varieties. So with that, I'll just kind of finish things up again, bringing this back around to a farmer perspective here uh, and in terms of what we would you know, recommend to our farmers based on some of the work that we've done so far. We can sort of break this down into four main categories where we, you know, adjust our cultural practices, looking at maybe a wider row spacing, but really concentrating again on reducing planting populations, uh, urging them to not forget about resistant varieties. Sometimes we get hyper-focused on yield here in the U.S. and we make our decisions based on yield, but we need to keep in mind we have uh, certain diseases which can impact that yield. And then we can look at fungicide programs, but we need to resist the temptation of a silver bullet there. We, we do have an over-reliance here in the U.S. on fungicides. We seem to have our pretty high expectations. And so what we've been trying to get people to realize is, you know, fungicides just make a bad situation less bad. And so, uh, you know, to really optimize the use of those fungicides, they need to get the timing right. So we've been, again, pushing them towards you know, utilizing things like Sporecaster, uh, some of these other predictive tools we have out there to increase the efficiency of our fungicide products. And then looking ahead and, and making some investments into some of this new technology, roller crimping rye, you know, understanding how cover crops play a role in reducing uh, white mold severity in their fields, and then supporting some of the development of maybe these interfering RNA technologies and some of those things. And so we've seen some investments uh, from our grower groups here in the U.S. Uh, to look at some of these uh, technologies, which, which admittedly maybe are further down the road, uh, but do seem to have some good promise. And so they, they do see that coming and, and they are making some of those investments. So with that, I'll just wrap up here with some thanks. We do have a lot of folks uh, involved in this various process, uh, in these various uh, research uh, products. Uh, a lot of former lab personnel listed here. We have a lot of UW collaborators as well as folks from uh, different universities, which you can see all listed there. We do have funding uh, sources through the various uh, soybean checkoff programs that we have here in the U.S. And of course, uh, lots of support from uh, various uh, weather modeling sources and, and of course, the U.S. Uh, Department of Ag here in the U.S. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, show you my contact information. I am uh, pretty available, especially via email and, and some of those things, as, as Lisa mentioned at the beginning. I do have a website out there. We do a lot of video work uh, and, and blogging on the website, so badgercropdoc.com. Uh, and I'm pretty active on Twitter as well, at Badger Crop Doc. So if you'd like to learn more just about what we're doing, white mold, uh, I also cover corn and, and alfalfa and wheat here in, in Wisconsin. So we have lots of work uh, on those various crops as well. But sclerotinia is definitely one of our main concerns here. And I spend a, a large portion of my time on that particular uh, subject. So uh, with that, I will stop my screen share and I can turn things I guess back over to Lisa and we can dig in for some questions, I guess. Thank you so much, Damon. That was very insightful. I've got a few 
really cool research ideas that you've shaken loose. <laughs> so thank you for sharing that with us. So I see we have some questions. I'm going to, um, st we have until about, if I can remember the program, about 10 past five. So that's for another um, about 15, 20 minutes. Um, so at what stage, uh, you did uh, mention this in your talk, but I'm going to ask the question again um, for those that maybe joined a little later. At what stage um, of soybean um, production um, does the sclerotinia disease cause the most yield loss in the field? Yeah, so the main infections are, are between the, the start of flowering and the start of pod. So 90 to 95% of the infections in soybean. So we're just, we're focused on soybean. I realize that this is different in other crops like sunflower and that sort of thing where we can have myceliogenic infections and, and those sorts of things. But what we've seen is that the main impacts are during that bloom and beginning pod stage. And so you know, when we're trying to make the decisions in terms of fungicide applications, that's really the main window of opportunity for us to protect those flowers and, and protect the stems from infection. We have done quite a bit of work looking at R4, R5 applications of fungicide, and we can quickly see how, you know, the efficacy of those products begin to really drop off uh, as we get to those later growth stages. A lot of farmers, you know, especially this year, we had a we had a pretty significant outbreak of white mold up in the central part of the state again this year, and a lot of farmers were calling saying, you know, well, white mold just is blazing down the rows, you know, and they and there is some plant to plant contact that happens in soybeans, but in our assessment, at least when we follow this over time, it isn't as fast as they think, you know, it takes. It takes five to seven days when we place the, the fungus on the plant before we start to actually see some lesion development. And then to actually get to the point where we produce mycelium to actually pass to the next plant, you're talking another 14 to 21 days before that process happens. So this visual assessment of, well, it runs down the rows isn't necessarily accurate. What they're actually seeing is a lot of our varieties are highly uh, indeterminate. So they bloom over a really wide range of time. And, and one of the inclinations here in the U.S. is to actually push maturity group uh, for various environments. So we're seeing a lot of later soybean varieties being planted, which is good for yield, but that opens up that window of opportunity for the fungus. So when we used to see bloom times of, say, three weeks, now we're seeing bloom times, you know, five and six weeks long. And so we, we, have, an, we have this whole array of infections that happen over time that folks are, are just seeing it when they, when they see this whole, hey, it runs down the, the field sort of thing. So there's some things agronomically, you know, we try to tell folks, especially in heavy white mold fields, you know, try to resist the temptation or, you know, pushing maturity group too much because that can really get you headed in the wrong direction pretty fast when it comes to white mold. Yeah, so I'm going to, I will get to all the questions that are there. I'm just going to jump to the questions that kind of link um, to the answer and the question beforehand. Um, so um, there's a question here. Um, how much research has been done on planting dates and whether altering it could potentially prevent the flowering stage of soybean coinciding with those conducive conditions for ascospore release? Yeah, actually, you know, there's there's quite a bit of that going on between myself and also our agronomists here in the upper Midwest. So there there is this uh, op, there's also this sort of subsequent push for farmers to plant early, early, early. So we had some farmers actually plant uh, in early in mid April this year, which would be almost a month earlier than our normal planting dates here in the in the north central U.S. And so. There, there is a lot of push there. And we saw the effects of that early planting quite readily when it came to the impact of white mold. So you're exactly right. If you get the maturity group, you know, right for our locale and you plant that maturity group early, you can get them through that flowering process mostly before the weather really lines up. So they will tend to escape. We also saw this early on where we chose early maturity early maturing group, um, early MG soybeans, uh, and we plant those here, they'll, they'll escape, but we give up some yield there as well. So there is this whole thing where we can sort of induce a, a, or move that bloom time a little bit to try to miss the white mold window. We also had some soybeans get planted pretty late here, and those soybeans were the ones that got hit the hardest uh, when it came to white mold this season. <laughs> 
right, so we're going to take a live question from um, Mike. You can just maybe join us. You can turn your uh, yeah, I had this. I, I, I'm here um, just because I'm too lazy to to type type a question. Devin, firstly, thanks for a lovely talk and uh, yeah, very nice practical stuff too. Um, you mentioned, and it's not surprising, that genotypes of sclerotinia differ in in, in their aggressiveness. Um, so you choose your genotypes carefully for, say, for instance, inoculations and selecting. Um, resistant varieties. But how much genetic variation is there in the pathogen? I mean, I, I imagine, I, I can't remember even whether whether it's known whether this is a homothallic pathogen or a heterothallic pathogen. So you've got to tell us something, but I mean, one would imagine there's huge genetic vari variability in the population in fields. So how, how do you work through that to, I mean, how many genotypes do you need to consider when you start to think about which isolates are used in pathogenicity tests, was that just too complicated? I don't know. Yeah, it, it, so it is homothallic, uh, but what's interesting here in the U.S. is that when we look at, you know, there, it, it's hard to sort of prior to you know population genetics and, and technologies like that. Everybody used MCGs, right? Mycelial compatibility groups to sort of understand what the population makeup was, and yeah. in the Midwest like we have like two MCGs, right? So it didn't really tell us much. Okay. I, had a, I had a visiting scientist, uh, she came from, over from Poland and actually brought some trifoliorum isolates along with some uh, sclerotinia sclerotiorum isolates. And she started to dig into the genetics a bit. And actually there's, there's quite a bit of genetic uh, variability within the ITS. And she looked at um, elongation factors and a couple other gene targets uh, in there. And there is quite a bit of genetic variation, not so much in the U.S. populations, but when we started to look at some of the European uh, populations that she had uh, brought over and we're looking at. So I, I do know that, you know, at least by continent, you can have a wide variation as well. So what we've done here is we've, we've tried to capture some of that, but we did sort of our best you know, we have like a hundred isolates in the collection at this point from lots of different areas. And we tried to go into the collection and choose isolates, which represented sort of an array of what we knew about the populations across that collection. Does that represent sclerotinia worldwide? No, I'm not going to say that, but at some level it does represent, you know, what we would probably see in many of the soybean fields, right? And so in the pitch in the paper that we made in, 20, in 2017, we said, well, there, here's a nine isolate panel that reasonably represents what uh, a certain uh, soybean genotype might run into. But that sort of painted us into a corner because then we made, <laughs> we made this pitch that, well, you, have to, you should be screening with these nine isolates. And well, when you, you start doing the math, you know, if you've got a breeding program where you're looking at 2,000 lines, you know, 2000 by nine, is, you know, it's a big number and impossible. And so that's why when Wade got here, he said, well, let's, let's borrow from the wheat world. You know, the wheat world has, you know, these, these genotype panels for various diseases where we can screen against, you know, and have a reasonable idea what, you know, what a, a certain genotype, soybean genotype, might fall into in terms of resistant, moderately resistant, susceptible. And so we've started to push in that direction with the idea that, well, if we can screen with just one aggressive isolate to sort of whittle everything down to a manageable group, and then before we're going to release a line, then come back with those nine um, isolates that we know sort of represent a range of populations and, and just rescreen those to be sure that they're reasonably resistant across an array of, of populations, then we can deploy those and have a good idea that they'll generally hold up in terms of resistance. Now, am I going to guarantee that they won't run into a sclerotinia? Sure. That, I mean, that it's bound to happen, but it does give us an improved, you know, an improved way of basically screening and, and making sure that things have some level of durable resistance, in our opinion. Yeah, no, that, that's really great. Sorry to ask a question with so many pieces to it, but really interesting. And thanks, Lisa. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry for not seeing the raised hand. I am keeping a closer eye on that now as well. So if those any of you would like to raise a hand, I am keeping an eye not just on the chats. Hey, 
I have also going to quickly post here, I think it's the article from the link to the article from 2017, comprehensive um, steratinia stem rot screening of soybean germplasm requires multiple isolates for steratinia steratiorum. Okay. Excellent. Um, right. Yeah. So I'm like multitasking here, but it's useful if you know, if you can have the access um, to that paper. So I have a question here um, on, hello, Dr. Smith. Thank you for the really nice talk. Did you observe any unintended effect of silencing the enzyme on soybean growth yield or other phenotypes? Yeah, that's a great question. We didn't actually carry uh, the plants out to uh, yield, actually. This was all done in a, in a growth chamber at this point. We were just showing proof of concept uh, that we could actually silence um, that, that uh, enzyme in the fungus. In that paper, we also report, you know, some work we did where we showed that the fungus can actually take up the small interfering RNAs. That was sort of step one. You know, then moving the, the silencing vectors into, or the silencing constructs into the vector, delivering the vector and all that sort of thing. So that paper was basically a proof of concept. We've subsequently now moved to, we actually have a, a transformation facility here at the University of Wisconsin. So we're working right now with them to try to actually uh, use GMO technology to insert um, those constructs into, into some germplasm and develop stable uh, transformants that we then could carry through to some of these other um, you know, processes. We don't expect there to be too much of a negative impact because we're targeting a fungal enzyme there, but you're certainly right. There could be some issues with you know, off-target uh, things. Now, when it relates to the actual BPMV vector, certain lines do respond, you know, as you might expect, to, you know, bean pod model virus. And so we did have to choose our, our varieties carefully in terms of that. But, um, you know, hopefully by uncoupling the BPMV vector now and actually just having the silencing construct inserted into those soybeans, we shouldn't have any issues, hopefully, uh, in terms of off-target effects on those soybeans. But we'll, we'll see as we move into some of that, that uh, subsequent work. Thank you very much. So it seems that there um, is a question as well about um, looking at germplasm health. Um, in South Africa, we have thresholds for the amount of sclerotia allowed in seed. And I know that a majority of soybean producers in South Africa are uh, re um, using farm saved seed in the following seasons. Um, so that also um, you know, increases the likelihood of carrying over your sclerotia. But in, um, in the US, or uh, well, in your region specifically, um, what is the role of germplasm health testing on the control of um, stem rot and or white mold? And you know, what are are there any legislations in place? You know, um, for seed-borne um, steratinia. Yeah. So our our seed um, our our seed programs are a little different here in the U.S. We we have such a heavy reliance on GMO technology here and patented varieties. So even if it's not a, a genetically modified version of soybean, we have uh, most of our commercial varieties are protected under uh, plant variety protection patents. And so where I'm headed there is we have very little on-farm seed saved here. Legally, a farmer can't save seed in most cases, unless they're in a unique situation where um, you know, they're growing a off patent, uh, non-genetically modified variety. And that's a pretty rare case here, probably less than 5% of our farmers would fall into that category. So all the seed, they have to buy their seed from a seed supplier every year. And there are some pretty important regulations for those seed suppliers that they have to follow in terms of clean seed, uh, reducing inoculum, and some of those things. Is it at the level that you have in South Africa? Not really. I mean, we still see some, uh, we see some movement, we think of sclerotinia from some infected seed. Now, is there visible sclerotia in those seed supplies? No, I mean, they do a pretty good job of taking out, you know, sclerotia and other foreign matter from that seed supply. But we do know that, you know, mycelium can survive on the, on the seed coat to a certain extent on some, you know, seed that's not heavily infected and makes it through the cleaning process. So there's certainly some mechanisms for that to happen. We're also moving into looking at actually how does resistance play a role in actually reducing um, 
inoculum return. So this is a new area that we're really interested in and it was sort of born out of the work that we did in terms of um, integrated management. And actually uh, Emerson Del Pont in Brazil, you know, they've been doing a lot of this work actually looking at, you know, how much sclerosis is actually returned based on the disease incidence levels. And so we, we um, use some of Emerson's numbers to actually interpolate how, how does, how do our management practices actually reduce inoculum return? And it's quite astounding, you know, reducing plant population, for instance, can drop inoculum return by like 50%. So there's some added benefits of controlling white mold outside of yield preservation that can, you know, benefit us down the road as well. So this is sort of a newer area that we're going to move into. And I think following how does resistance actually play a role in that inoculum return, I think would be really interesting as well. I completely agree. And I think that's something that is often taken for granted with a pathogen like sclerotinia, that, you know, that forward future kind of thinking of your um, disease management, because you're not only concerned about this season. And it was so nice to see that you also say, you know, you're doing disease mapping of where are the specific places in the fields that you're seeing diseases. This is some of the advice we give to farmers as well. You know, uh, if you have multiple fields, go mark out on the fields, you know, where you've seen it and you know, you're seeing more or less of it in certain regions. So I have a question here re relating to um, apothecia and um, nighttime temperatures. So um, just want to quickly scroll down. Um, all right, so the temperature and the formation of apothecia, I'd like to know if, um, what effect do nighttime temperatures have in apothecia formation? Or perhaps in places where night temperatures are not very low, around 19 degrees Celsius, um, can apothecia still form? Yeah, so we're, we're, we, we look at that pretty closely. And actually in our models, we, um, we actually use um, maximum observed temperatures for those days. And that's negatively correlated as you might expect to um, development because that's a surrogate for how hot it gets during the day. Is that an on off switch actually? Because, you know, the biology obviously is that probably a lot of the formations happening in the evening hours where we have some wetness, you know, you get the light triggers that help with cup formation, but actual continual development is probably happening all the time, even in the dark, especially probably ascospore development, because we know as the sun comes up, the humidity drops and that's a trigger. So apothecia will puff, you know, kind of late morning into the early afternoons. And then as that humidity sets back in, they'll stop puffing again. And so, you know, it's, it's, we think it's really impactful in terms of what those nighttime temperatures are, uh, but we're using sort of, we're using logistic regression basically so we can capture the range essentially. We've gone away from using hard and fast thresholds. I used to, when we did a lot of our modeling early on, we used to use these, you know, like, all right, here's the range that sclerotinia you know, it starts here and ends here. Well, the biology isn't that clean. And we know that. And the beauty of using logistic regression is that we can capture a wider range of temperatures there. And we can also look at the interactions more easily of how does moisture offset what that range might be. And the other thing is that we're starting, I don't have any great data to back this up, but I think there's, there's these subtle shifts too in you know, climate change and pushing some of these maybe ecotypes to be able to, you know, do their thing in even warmer temperatures. You know, we're starting to see, we had the hottest summer on record here in, in Wisconsin, and we still had ample amounts of white mold, right? So we actually collected a few isolates this year, and we're in the process right now. We have a, we have a couple of undergrad students actually looking at how aggressive these isolates are and what their temperature ranges and things might be because we're curious whether we're starting to see maybe some shifts of ecotypes that actually can can survive higher temperatures. So I'm less concerned, I think, about temperature because I think temperature, you know, fluctuates and these organisms can survive those things. Do they get more active or less active? Certainly, but I think moisture is the biggest driver. So as long as we have those moisture, uh, you know, requirements, then the fungus is is just fine doing its thing, regardless of how hot you know it gets within within reason. I mean, we can't can't get overly hot, but you know the range that we sit here in the north central is 
you know, that's, that's a pretty good range and pretty conducive for white mold here. Yeah, and I think that's also, as you said, one of the benefits for using that logistic regression, you can get the different risk, right. you know, um, regions. I'm going to take one last question. I'm really sorry if we didn't get to all the questions in the chat. Maybe we can um, see if we can forward them to Damon and get an opinion. You know, putting things in writing is sometimes a risk, but we'll take it with a pinch of salt. So I'm going to ask Godfrey to um, unmute his mic and he can ask us a question. Thank you, Damon, for the really lovely talk. Uh, yeah, I, I have two questions. Uh, the first one, um, the fungi side application that you spoke about, that it really helps control or lower the, the infection rate. Uh, and one, one of the things that, 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 the, that the came across rate. is that of um, using strobrulin-based uh, sort of fungicides. I don't, uh, uh, have you checked whether it controls the disease or it actually rather boosts the, 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 the growth of the plant? Because I remember when I did uh, my studies, previous studies, uh, we were not, uh, we're looking at controlling alternaria. We learned that it, it actually does not reduce the infection rate, but it actually elongates the senes uh, senescence uh, of the plant. And as, as a result, uh, we would get more yield controlling it with, with fungicides. Okay, that's, that's my first question. And the second part is more of a comment that I, I'd like to really agree with you that the biggest contributing factor uh, to SSR would be then, uh, uh, is it moisture, which is uh, generally contributed by, by, I had a discussion with the, with the group on Monday that uh, plant populations, if it's heavily, when you had like bigger plant population, you will most definitely, or there's a greater chance of, of, of uh, getting infection in your field. Because just, just in closing, when you look at the, the, the more advanced farmers that we, we had, uh, they aim at run about 3.5 uh, um, tons per hectare, whereas uh, the, 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 the upcoming farmers aim for two. The upcoming farmers did not have any sclerotinia, even though they like almost have adjacent farms they, they, they work like literally next next to each other whereas the the, the, the more commercial farmers would have uh, had a heavier impact so moisture does play a, a greater role thanks yeah so the the first question on uh, strobilurins we we've looked a little bit at uh, the strobilurin effect and what's interesting about the strobilurin group is they're not all created equal in terms of their efficacy against Sclerotinia, for instance, you know, pick oxystrobin, which you know is a is a pretty important program for us here in the U.S. That one does have efficacy directly on the fungus. So there have been, you know, poison plate assays, efficacy experiments, and some of those things um, related to that. However, if we use azoxystrobin here, we can actually make white mold worse, you know? And so it's a case by case scenario when we look at the strobilurins. Now, what is the effect on, you know, this, this plant health promotion idea in soybean? There is certainly a little bit of that. We don't think it's as strong in soybean and white mold in that particular pathosystem as it is say in corn. Corn, we see a pretty dramatic, uh, plant health response out of the strobilurins here. But we do know that there's a little bit because when you go into a pick, into a field that was sprayed with picoxystrobin, those plants are usually green longer. Uh, they're usually harder to harvest for the farmer because the stems tend to want to stay uh, greener and some of those things. Uh, so, so there are some physiological things that happen there. Is it as strong in soybean against white mold? Maybe not, uh, but there is a little bit of that. It's more of a, a direct efficacy against um, against the fungus itself. Now we've done some work related to this with lactofen, which is that herbicide. And we do see really heavy reductions in terms of white mold. And a lot of that actually is, is a response of the plant in, in SAR, so systemic acquired resistance that happens when lactofen is actually applied. So there is a plant effect when that particular product is actually applied. It's an upregulation of that systemic response, which does reduce uh, infection by the fungus and not a lot of direct impact on the fungus itself as far as that particular product. And yeah, it, it's, in terms of what you're talking about with planting populations, I, I've really, I've softened quite a bit on in terms of the row width thing, because we were, we were fighting farmers pretty heavily in terms of, trying to open row width, but 
they're very interested in, in adjusting planting populations, especially from a seed cost standpoint, because again, we have to buy our seed almost exclusively from seed suppliers every year. So, you know, that's an expensive process for, for a lot of farmers. And so if they can save on the seeding rates per acre, that's a good thing. And we know from the agronomist that we do hit a peak in terms of economic yield. And that sweet spot, again, is somewhere, you know, in our, in our geography, it's somewhere between that 270,000 to 345,000 seeds per hectare. So, you know, we are really starting to look at that intensively. We like the responses that we're getting. And we were recently funded on a, uh, a proposal where we're now going to look at mapping fields for white mold and then utilizing those maps into, uh, into you know, variable rate, rate seeding map so we can actually tell the planner, you know, put more seed here, put less seed there, and then use that same map also in our sprayers so we can actually reduce the amount of fungicide being actually applied across a particular field. So we'll see if that research pans out, but that's an exciting new area that we're also uh, moving into as well. Thanks so much, Damon and Godfrey, because I think that question um, showed us the kind of capacity um, that Damon and his team are working with. And I think that's something that us as South Africans and as plant health professionals are looking forward to also, you know, growing in um, here, especially um, as soybeans are starting to get the area planted is becoming much greater and will continue to, um, you know, even be planted in marginal regions. So um, talking about planting and our producers, I think I'd like to um, just give um, Dr. Miki Himan a, from Grain SA an opportunity um, to, yeah, to say something a little bit about Grain SA and to thank you. Thanks, Lisa, and, and thanks, Damon. That was a really enjoyable talk, and I, I think we can see it from the engagements as well. So just as a bit of background on Grain SA, we are a voluntary association of grain producers um, established to take care of the needs of our members and to make sure that producers in South Africa can stay profitable and also sustainable. So Grain SA has three main streams in which we provide commodity-specific strategic support that the economic related activities, but also farmer development and research. And now that's of course where I fit in. So within our research team, we fill a very niche role in terms of making sure that the challenges that producers face on farm level are addressed by the research community. And also to make sure that the outputs coming from the research community also reaches the farmers. And I think that was what was really inspiring about the talk today is to see how closely your work is aligned between the research, but also the on-farm practical side to get to that point where it's really critically relevant for those really suffering the losses. In our team, a lot of the work we do is built on the foundation of building partnerships and establishing collaborations. And I think when we deal with diseases like sclerotinia, where the stakes are so high for producers, it becomes even more important that as a research community in South Africa, researchers really get together and work to collectively work towards solutions. And I know that talking about all of these problems we face won't really get to solutions, but it's, it's so important that we are aware of what's happening on, on farm level, that we're aware of what the production practices are, what are the different research avenues that need to be investigated so that we can get to solutions that's actually relevant to our producers here in South Africa on farm level. So thank you again for your time today and also thank you to the organizers at Fabi and also to Lisa for hosting. Thank you so much. I just want to follow up on that, um, Damon, and say um, thank you very much for the opportunity that you've shared with us. And I think seeing the practical um, responses, you know, that your research is um, moving in and, you know, you're interacting with the growers, um, maybe you could give us just one quick wrap up on, you know, something to encourage, um, you know, people that are students or graduates that are involved in um, research in general and steratinia research that's associated with producers. Um, and yeah, so just for those of you that are interested in sclerotinia research, um, we have the South African um, sclerotinia research um, network. I will add the website and this is supported by Grain SA and our different partnerships.
So yeah, I just would like to hear one last wrap up from you, Damon, on um, just, yeah, some encouragement on working with producers before I hand over to Dr. Slippage to wrap up. Sure, yeah, I mean, we, my program has always been heavily focused on what farmers' needs are. And we, you know, one of the very first meetings I had when I got to Wisconsin was actually with our Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board, who's one of our funding partners uh, here in the, in the state. And he said, well, your research is great, but, you know, if it just sits in the library collecting dust, then it really doesn't matter. And that was huge for me, you know, that, that really hit home. And so since I've been here for the last 10 years, I've tried to, you know, Everything we do uh, in, in the research lab, we try to have some vision on how that could be applied down the road. Is that trajectory longer than others? Sure, uh, but we try to make sure that eventually there's an output that, that the farmer can use directly. And so we, we try to have the graduate students uh, interact with those farmers so that they understand the needs of the farmer. So we're always, you know, we're out in the field. Just two weeks ago, we had uh, actually a, a grower meeting uh, where we met with our Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board. So they came out, they looked at our research plots and talked to our graduate students directly. And that's that's a huge experience for, for our students. That's a huge experience for our farmers. And that, you know, that interaction is where a lot of these research questions get off the ground and how we start doing a lot of our work. So I think, you know, one of the things we do, and I encourage everybody who's who's in the ag research side of things is you know just stay connected to the farmer and know what their problems are and and try to have that vision on what are the what are the cool things we can do to help them you know be profitable and and reduce these disease issues